you want to hit record, please, that would be great. Sharon, and welcome to everyone. Welcome to this, our last of the three Hawk Talks of the summer series. I'm Robin LeBlanc, I'm with Plan New Hampshire, and I welcome each and every one of you. It's been great to chat with you this morning. Today, we're going to be talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and what are they and how can we use them and this hierarchy as a guide for planning for the futures of our community. Before we get too far, I wanna thank Ann Weidman of JSA. Ann helped me to put this, uh, the slideshow together for you and you'll see some little interesting tidbits that in it that that was Ann. And I also wanna thank Sharon Cowan with Plan New Hampshire and she's kind of the woman behind the curtain who was, who was helping um, with all of this. So Plan New Hampshire, as many of you know, has a vision of healthy and vibrant communities across the state. And our mission to get there is to foster excellence in planning and design and development of our built environment. So that's our focus is the built environment. And our strategy to do that is to share information and information with you all, our communities, the professionals who work in them and shape them, about how community design and the built environment can contribute positively to where we live and where we work and where we play right here in New Hampshire. So today we're going to talk about Abraham Maslow. He was a psychologist in the last century. We're actually not talking about him, we're talking about his work. I don't know really very much about him at all. And when he was, during World War II, he was a young dad and he saw the horrors of what was the aftermath of the war. And at that point, he decided to shift his focus to, he decided to shift his focus to what is it that makes us, that will help us to survive and what makes us thrive. If everyone could shut their audio off, please. Thank you. So he created what's now known as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And as, as you can see, it's pyramid. This is a variation. We see there are very um, different visuals of this, but basically gets to the same. So at the very bottom are our physiological needs. What does our body need to survive? Safety, love and belonging, connections with other people. Those are absolutely critical for, you know, for our needs. Then we have esteem and we have self-actualization. So the bottom three are what we need to survive as human beings. The top three are what we need to thrive. And we have to start and work on each one. We're gonna go, and what we're gonna to do today, the top three are super, the top two are super important, but what we're going to focus on today is these bottom three, the physiological, the safety, and um, connections with other people. And the reason I'm doing this is I've been thinking that we're all saying we don't want to go back to where we were. We're the, we don't want to go back to the normal. And so many are saying, how can we use information that we're seeing now? We're seeing so many things now that, we're, that we can't not see anymore, especially in our communities where there's a lot of inequities and a lot of disparities. And so thinking about our own needs, how can we think about addressing those? I don't have any answers, but just to get us thinking, what can we use as a guide to create new futures for ourselves here in New Hampshire? If indeed that's what communities want to do. And I think a lot of them do. So we wanna create a new future for everyone in our communities, but what do we have to think about to get there? And what would it take to get there? So the first set of needs are our physiological needs. And for that, of course, we need water and we need food. And we need water, not just to drink, but as COVID has revealed, we need water for hygiene as well, don't we? And think about the people in your community that do not have access to food on a regular basis or to water, whether for drinking or for washing. We also, of course, need clothing and footwear and we need shelter. And and, and now, especially with the whole issue of so many people being evicted from their apartments or the, or the possibility thereof, it has really revealed the, the, the absolute critical importance of shelter and having a safe place to call home. And what a, what a linchpin that is for stability, for families, for people. 
So does everyone in your community have access to shelter? What would it take for them to get there? What would it take for a community to say, these people don't have a permanent place to live. What can we do to, to assist them? What would that take? Another critical piece that um, I think is a little underestimated is, is the notion of sleep. A lot of, do a lot of people, especially those without a place to live, do they have a safe place to sleep at night? So many of us remember the having young children and how awful it was when we just couldn't get a good night's sleep night after night after night. And there are people that live that way a lot. So are there places, what would it take for, for your community to say, who doesn't have a place to sleep at night and what can we do to offer them a safe place to sleep? Because that also helps keep their body going. And finally, health, although health is an overarching theme in a lot of this, think about health. And even if you had all of the other, if you had some health issues that were not being addressed, say you had no health insurance, what if you had a raging fever, an open wound, and you had no access to health? Think what that could do to your, think what that could do to your body. So what would it take for your community to think about, does everyone have access to basic health care when they need it? The next up is safety. Once you get your body, your physiological needs, the next thing to, that people think about is safety for our, as human beings. Back in the day, our ancestors had to worry about wild animals and tigers and um, a lot of things that we don't think about today, although I'm not sure if people actually were on Earth at the same time as dinosaurs. We don't have to think about so, that so much anymore, but there are some other safety issues that are really critical to our, um, to our survival. Certainly emotional and physical issues um, in our homes, um, older adults being scammed and just, rob just um, robbery in general, um, people being bullied. Um, I don't know, this, the, unfortunately the this, this side um, slides here kind of hide the, the picture in the upper right hand corner, but um, our homes safe inside for especially older adults like scatter rugs and maybe loose wires. Um, some people tend to um, not throw things away, so are there fire hazards in the home? But also things like asbestos and radon, um, some people live with. And some people, um, is it safe to turn the tap on? Is there water drinkable? Um, is, the, is the heating system working properly? Those are some safety issues to think of as far as um, physical and then emotional. Um, there are so many people that are living with verbal abuse and physical abuse and neglect those are the things that we don't see as much. And unfortunately, it's really revealed the pandemic when people have had to stay isolated or haven't been able to go to work where they might have, may have, might have coworkers to kind of keep an eye on them or they might have counseling at work or at school, a lot of children at school. One of the reasons there is a push to, to open schools again is so children that are in um, dangerous situations at home have, they can go back to school where it's safe and talk to counselors. But how, what would it take in your community to really identify who these people are? It, it's already being done to a certain extent, granted, but it's just something to think about in creating a new future for your community and the people in it, everyone in it. Another um, safety issue, of course, is finance. And right now, finance is very um, dicey for a, a lot of people. People are losing their jobs. Um, businesses are not doing well. And we said earlier that one of the, the, the um, real kingpins for stability is, is a home or a, at least a permanent place to live. And certainly finances is another one in jobs. So what can you do as a community to ensure financial stability? You can't really ensure it, but what can you do to support it? One thing you can do is support local businesses, local businesses where money stays local. And the other is to take a look at your, at your government finances and what's being spent and what isn't. And for that, I really recommend, there's an, there's an organization called, called um, Strong Towns. And he talks, one of his big um, overarching theories is that, and, and it's been, he proves it out, is, is how municipalities are spending money that they, that they don't even see that they need to. Um, and a lot of municipalities are not in great shape. So, and especially now it's being exacerbated with the pandemic. So what can we do um, as, as 
people who care, what can we do to, um, to support and, and, and help keep things from getting too bad? The last safety is, of course, our health. We need to protect our health. And all of, many of us have basic health um, that's okay, but how can we protect that? Certainly um, today we're worried about COVID and trying to stay as healthy as we can um, until there's a vaccine and or other ways of, of um, addressing that. But what other health issues are there that we could be thinking about as a community? Um, certainly mental health and physical health and we wanna keep things safe um, one big thing that people, um, even doctors are saying, get outside and get moving and get where it's green. So is your community, or are your communities providing bike paths and bike lanes? A lot of you, you may have those um, walking paths, parks, places to, to be outside where it's safe. Um, and certainly health care workers um, play an important part, but believe it or not, that's only 20% of our health is, is driven by whether what doctors we go see and what medicines we take. The rest of it are the choices we make and um, our, our, our environment. Some people say our zip code determines the, our health. So is there access to healthy food? Is there access to places to, to be healthy? The other thing to think about here that's, that's only now beginning to be understood is isolation and loneliness. And there are many, particularly older adults that live by themselves. They may still be in the big house or they, they may be housebound for whatever reason. And isolation and loneliness lead to depression and that in turn leads to a lot of um, medical issues. So they're only now starting to understand that. And it's not only older adults, there's a lot of young professionals. Stay Work Play did a, um, a survey a couple of years, maybe three or four years ago now, where they discovered that 25% of the young adults did not have any friends or family nearby. And so we can imagine that that might be exacerbated by this. So if they're living at home alone, used to be able to go to work, but now they're working from home. And so, especially in the smaller towns, when there isn't a place to go to, to hang out with other people, and, and a lot of people don't want to do that now, it's just something to keep in mind. As I said, I don't have any answers. I'm just raising some of these things to think about. And finally, the last thing is connections with other people. There was a song years ago, People Need People. And um, we all want love and belonging. We all want to feel, we want to feel that we belong somewhere with someone or a group of people. Granted, there are people who could care less and they just want to be left alone. But for the most part, people want to stay connected to other people. So is there a way in your community, no matter what size, is there a way for everyone to stay connected with the people they want to stay connected with? Whether it's through, whether you have good cell phone service or broadband, whether people are popping in to say hello, um, believe it or not, Meals on Wheels for some of the older homebound adults, that's great not just for the food, but also sometimes that's the only people that they ever see is the Meals on Wheels driver. So thinking about connections, not only with each other and friends and neighbors, but with the community, how can you keep people connected to your community as a whole so that they really feel that they belong as part of your community? So these are the basics. These are the basic needs. And these are, these are the things that, that really, if we think about them, these are the ones that help us to survive as human beings beings. And once we can address those, again, then we can take a look at esteem and we can look at self-actualization. But these three on the bottom, these needs, what can we do as communities to ensure that everyone in our community is having those needs met so that they can not only survive, but they can they themselves start to thrive. One of the things in closing that I want to mention to, to actually address those to help to help kind of frame how we address those is to think about the difference between equality and equity. And equality is when you give everyone, everyone wants to do the same thing. In this case, they want to look over the fence and watch the soccer game. So they're all, and, but they're all, and they're all given a box. But equity is when they are, equity is when they're all given what they need in order to achieve what they want. So with that, that's a good segue to let you all know that's the closing of 
talking about the needs, but it does connect to, I just want to make an announcement now that save the dates, October 6th, 13th, and 20th, we're having a series of webinars called Belonging by Design. And we're going to look at how can we, how does our community through design, through community planning and through design, help people feel that they're connected to their communities and that they, and that they really belong in their communities. Um, the, the sixth has not been confirmed yet what the topic is, but the 13th, we will have a woman named Tamara Hill talk to us about diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are those three terms? Why are they important to us? And how can we use those notions in making the decisions that we make and the designs that we make through the built environment and then on the 20th, we have the executive director of the Institute for Human-Centered Design, Valerie Fletcher, is going to talk to us about, about um, what is human-centered design. And again, why is it so important? She's going to take a different, slightly different tack than Tomeyer. These are such important conversations. And once you hear them, you will never, you will not approach your work the same way again. And finally, Next week, the 13th, is our last um, webinar. It's going to be housing, transportation, and the link between the two on August 13th at noon. And then finally, if you're not a member of PLAN, we invite you to become a member. Go to PlanNH.org and um, take a look um, at the website, become a member, make a donation. We'd be, glad you, we'd be very glad if you do, and so will you. So thank you very much for um, this, and now, um, I forgot to tell you, if you have questions, to, to um, put them in the chat box, but um, if we could, I can stop, we can stop share now, and um, let's open it up and see who's here and see if anybody has any, any, um, any comments. Hello. Did any questions come in, Sharon? Um. I, I think it's uh, important um, to have the perspective you've just given that um, the things we really need in our communities um, are, are there to satisfy these needs at the various levels. Um, I've, I've been aware of uh, Aslo's uh, hierarchy of needs ever since college, but uh, to put them in the terms of what our communities need and, and what our people need at the various stages. Uh, we've been involved with this uh, age-friendly community uh, project now for a little over a year. And uh, it's interesting, we've put a hierarchy together, a matrix um, of the needs of the various age groups within our community and how our community is satisfying them or not, or only partially doing so. So uh, for me, this was uh, a valuable sort of reintroduction to uh, putting Maslow's hierarchy of needs together with what we're looking at uh, in our community's needs. So thank you. Oh, good. oh thank you. I'm glad. Thank you. I'm glad. It, I'm, that's great. It is, it is striking. Um, to your point, how often we, how much we're hearing about public policy issues these days and how rarely we hear it couched in terms of people. Interesting observation. Thank you, Rob. I wonder why that is. It's, I guess it's our, our tendency to, to, yeah, the policy to, to, if it's not, if, yeah, it makes it less, I don't know, it's not really necessarily othering, but sometimes it is othering. Um, and sometimes it isn't as personal. We don't have to get as involved with it emotionally if, it's, if, if we don't mention the people. It's just the, the, um, the situation. And that does raise a point, Rob, it, that um, how often we don't talk about people. We, I try to, I'm trying to train myself to say, people without a place to live, not homeless, or people who don't, who, who don't have enough food rather than the, um, the starving or whatever. So we tend to, and we also tend to label people by what they're not or what they don't have or what their deficiencies are, rather than way, by talking about this person, this person is a great cook, 
um, and he can't hear. Okay, so, oh, he's deaf. All right, so that's, that's how we also tend to be. The labels tend to reveal what we're prioritizing as a culture. So even when we're talking about people matters, uh, personalistic matters, we tend to use a vocabulary, this is I think what you're saying, that is either economic, um, military, um, uh, political, uh, and such. Mm. Interesting, yeah. Anybody else? No one? Okay. Let's see if there are any questions in chat. So there aren't any answers to this, certainly, but um, we do, one of the things that I wanted to try to get across is that we tend to think about um, our community from our own point of view. And we, all, we tend to think about, and I've heard community members, for example, um, when we were talking about um, ADUs three or four years ago, um, we were giving a workshop about ADUs and this um, person came up to me and said, um, he said, oh, we don't need ADUs in, in our community. He said, those of us in the planning board, we decided we didn't need ADUs because we're fine. And so he was thinking in terms of his own situation and the people that he knew in the community in his, their own situation they didn't need accessory dwelling units. But then when I pressed him and I said, well, do you have children? Oh yeah, but they can't live here. Or they, some people just don't think beyond their own circles or they are the people that they see. And what I'm trying to get to here is let's go beyond that and let's look out to the people that we don't see and why don't we see them in our community or why are they not showing up or, um, because there are many communities have so many facets and so many different kinds of people. We need to look beyond the people that are like us and see who else is out there and are those needs being met. Robin, oh. <clears throat> Robin I just have a comment. Um, this is Butch. Um, on accessory dwelling units, um, we're seeing a phenomenon uh, here and probably around the state and country, but the state, we'll talk about the state. Um, they're taking the accessory dwelling unit statute and uh, we have uh, very clever developers that are turning those into short-term rentals. Never what the, ordered, the ordinance or the law was initially done to take care of an elderly patient. So we're seeing that and I'm to the point of we just went over a thousand um, short term rental units in Lincoln in less than 14 months. Um, so called abuse, uh, but certainly it's there's no uh, retired folks in those auxiliary units. It's all uh, short term rentals. So that's that's something we're seeing. And, it goes to what you're saying is that it's about people, but it's people take advantage too. So, yeah, I'm that's that's interesting, Butch, and that is happening across. And it's particularly, I think, it's particularly acute up in your area um, um, in, for the for the winter seasons. And um, I do know that um, many towns around you, um, well, I think, I think all of the I, rentals are being scooped up. Um, yeah, I don't think it's unique to us. I, I've talked to my cohorts on the seacoast and um, just about everywhere in New Hampshire this this has yeah. happened. So um, yeah, I don't know if that's, I'm not saying it's a problem. I just think it's, it's a, an example of taking what well-intended law and turning it into a moneymaker. So it kind of defeats, in my opinion, and that's just a personal opinion, but um, you know, we're dealing with it, but it's just, it, it, um, 
it does give you pause. Yeah, it certainly does. And there's no easy answer, is there? There's no easy answer. Yes, Liz Ryan Cole. Hi, um, thinking about this in terms of needs, I would suggest that the people who are creating the rental units um, for short-term rentals have a need also. There's not a lot of money, especially in the North Country. And so this allows them to earn money that they couldn't otherwise do. So um, I don't think we should automatically think that having short-term rentals is bad. It's, it's only in that the, um, if our goal is offering ADUs is to provide affordable housing, we have to say, hmm, this is not a sufficient strategy. Yeah, there is, well, it's, a, it's part of a multi, but it's not, you're right, yeah. You're right. So, and, and it shouldn't have to be, it's not a zero sum game, so it's right. not either or. How can you have people be able to do that and yet still at the same time be able to provide places to live for people who need it um, at, at, at good price points that people can afford? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thanks for speaking out. I'm sorry I didn't comb my hair yet. It was, <laughs> it was one of those meetings. <laughs> right. Didn't even I notice. I myself <laughs> off now again, but bye. I'm, this is very interesting. I did actually post a question um, okay. to you privately on the chat. Okay. And I see that you probably don't see those, so then I put it out. Okay, generally. what's what's your question? So I said, um, um, tell us something about why you find this important for your planning work and whether you find that traditional planners, whether they're professionals or citizen planners respond positively. Are you asking me or are you asking the, the audience? Well, you, because you did such a nice summary and, and I found it very oh, thank you. well done, but I don't know that planners necessarily hear this. I know plan works very hard to get this out here, but um, I, I would think you'd get more of the, well, I don't need this. Right. So, well, it's just, it's as Seth Godin says, it's drip drip, drip. Hmm. After a while, maybe there will be a difference. But this is a huge mind shift. And I think that um, it's, been, it's been revealed by, by the pandemic that, that there are a lot of people who have some, some needs in the community that are not being addressed. There's a lot of disparities. There's a lot of inequities. And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because I'm not a planner. I'm not, I'm not anything. I just run Plan New Hampshire. But, um, but I think that, and I think that question, um, it's important to me because people have always been important to me, you know, and in a community, we should be starting with the people and we should, and in a community, we're all, as, as citizens, we have a responsibility um, to our community to be, to participate, but also to give and to help create. And this is, this is a, a new, also that it's, a, it's all about we. It's not of waiting for top down. It's grassroots. It's, it's grassroots up. It is our communities. These are our communities and we can make a difference. So what can we do together? And this is just one thing, one, one way to think about where can we start? What should we be thinking about um, in going forward? So I don't have a direct answer to that because I still have many questions myself. I just thought that this might be an interesting way to take a look at, at um, thinking about the future. So think, thank you, Liz. Uh, I think sometimes how we organize ourselves to deal with these things uh, influences what we do. For example, um, in Dover, I work at, in economic development, but part of the planning department works on community development, which separates economic and non-economic issues um, and I think that's a good separation because all issues are not economic in terms of community development and all the needs uh, are not driven by economics or shouldn't be. So uh, I think how we organize and structure ourselves to, to deal with these things can have an influence in that regard. It can. And that reminds me of an old, um, it came out, um, I can't remember her name. She's in Vermont. Um, I think her last name is, I can't remember. Anyway, but communities, if you picture Venn diagrams, communities actually are as a Venn diagram of th four different circles. So economics is one of them, but social, environmental, and governance. Every decision that's made is going to affect the other circle somehow. So 
on the one hand, it may be good to separate them, but on the other hand, they're still interconnected. And how they, and one decision, decisions made here are gonna affect the other, don't you think? I think there's a great deal of overlap. And yeah, yeah. Communication happens, but I, I think uh, it's important to have the overlap. Yeah. I think it's also important to have the separation so you can view the individual uh, separately. Right. Okay. Great. Well, well thank you. you. Yes, yes. Stuart has a question in the chat box. Stuart, can you read it out loud? Yeah, with the COVID worries not quickly going away, we will need to think about the inflow of them to here and friends out of staters buying homes in New Hampshire. Will we see this as a threat or an opportunity? Good grist for future Plan New Hampshire dialogue sponsorship. So the question is, is it a good thing or a bad thing to have people from away moving into New Hampshire? Is that what I'm getting? I think that's what I'm getting to. Okay. Stuart, why didn't you say that out loud? Um, <laughs> what do you all think? Good or bad, people from away coming in, bringing in their economic dollars, but also potentially bringing in um, um, more needs for services. Um, I know back in um, March and April, the state was worried that so many people would be coming in and then they would have COVID and then our, our small hospitals would be um, pretty much at capacity, which hasn't proved to be the case, but it's, it's still a concern. What do you all think? And some of you, please turn back your, your, your microphones on so we can hear you. So I've got a, a piece to say on that, I suppose. Um, I'm Harrison Kanzler. I'm from the Mount Washington Valley Housing Coalition. Um, so we, we have had out-of-staters buying property in Mount Washington Valley for a very long time. Um, and <clears throat> I don't think the, I don't think COVID has impacted our market too, too much. Um, but we still definitely have, I mean, we have 50, about 51% of um, units, available housing units in our area are um, vacant, meaning they're second home properties. So as far as being able to, as far as the hierarchy goes, um, we're in dire need for locals of things that will um, keep people here and make them feel like they're at home. Um, economically, it's obviously extremely beneficial. Um, the issue becomes how that impacts the housing market. Um, being able to provide a home for someone is becoming increasingly expensive. Um, my wife and I bought our house five years ago um, and the town estimates that our property in five years has um, has appreciated $84,000. And that's the town's assessment, which from the real estate market, um, that's usually conservative. Mm -hmm. So property values are going up, which obviously is detrimental to the local community in some regard, because folks who want to stay and work here um, are seeing increased property taxes because of the value of their house going up. Um, if they want to downgrade um, to single level living, if they're retiring, if they want to upgrade to a family home because they're starting a family, um, these things are becoming prohibitively expensive because we're not seeing that increase in wage um, that we're seeing uh, an increase in property prices because of the influx of people coming from higher wage earning areas like Boston and New York. Um, you know, for them, a $300,000 house, that's nothing, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, for us, that is well outside. I think HUD has us at just in the low 200,000s in Carroll County for affordable housing. Um, so when things are starting to be priced for that second home buyer market, um, it makes it very difficult for locals um, to get by in an affordable way. So it's great for our local business owners, um, but for their employees, it definitely creates some problems. And I know we had mentioned um, ADUs were mentioned earlier, and we are looking at ADUs as a, as a potential. Um, most of our towns have it set so that you cannot rent the ADU um, unless someone lives permanently in the primary residence or vice versa. So a lot of times you can have an ADU as long as someone is permanently residing there, then you can rent the house. 
Um, so trying to tap into those second home buyers and saying, hey, if you build an ADU and put it up as a long-term rental unit, you've now added more income to your property plus increased its value and you're providing housing for someone locally. Um, so we, we are looking at ADUs um, and I definitely understand the concerns um, that were mentioned earlier up in the Lincoln area. Um, but again, a lot of our towns already have that ADU ordinance set so that they they really can't be rented out unless someone is permanently residing in the house. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that, that helps us immensely as far as making sure they're not being abused and how they're working. But, um, but we, we try to embrace um, second home buyers coming in and people coming from away to live here. A lot of our communities also don't have the infrastructure that these folks are looking for. So I could see it impacting Southern New Hampshire more because a lot of our towns don't have access to high speed internet um, or acceptable cell service. Um, I think one big thing that COVID has done has increased the potential for remote work. So I think a lot, we definitely are gonna see an influx of people from urban areas looking to come live in a more rural setting because they can continue to work um, for their urban job from a rural setting. Um, so I, I think it's a concern, but I think there is benefit. I think there's more benefit to be had um, than there is the potential threat to locals as long as the community understands how it's going to impact the local markets and um, does everything it can to try to continue to aid its locals. So that's, I guess, my two cents on that. Thank you, Harrison. That's great. Well, we are way over. We said we'd stop at 930. And once again, we um, have gone beyond that. And this shows to me that there's a need for um, really some um, a venue for um, some kind of a venue for discussions and just roundtable discussions like this. I think it's fascinating to hear the thoughts of people from all over the state and because you each have a different viewpoint. So thank you. So thank you so much for attending today. Thank you for, um, for your thoughts about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you have any further comments about it, please share them with me. I would love to hear it. Um, this, as we said, has been uh, recorded and we will be posting it um, sometime within the next few days. So if you wanna take a look at it again. Meanwhile, if you have any questions or anything, just reach out to me. I'd be happy to, um, to answer them. And, and if you're not a member of PLAN, please become a member. If you feel like making a donation to PLAN, we are an independent organization and we rely heavily on our membership dues, but also the generosity of folks like you. Um, thank you so much. So thanks for being here and have a great day. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.